in the name of God, who makes a way in the wilderness, walks with us, and guides us in our pilgrimage. Amen. Holy One, we confess that we have wandered far from you. We have not trusted your promises. We have ignored your prophets in our own day. We have squandered our inheritance of grace. We have failed to recognize you in our midst. Have mercy on us. Forgive us and turn us again to you. Teach us to follow in your ways. Assure us again of your love and help us to love our neighbor. Amen. Beloved in Christ, the word draws near to you, and all who call out to God shall be saved. In Jesus, God comes to you again and again and gathers you under the wings of love. In Jesus' name, your sins are forgiven. God journeys with you and teaches you how to live in love. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of compassion, you welcome the wayward and you embrace us all with your mercy. By our baptism, clothe us with garments of your grace and feed us at the table of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading comes from 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This ends the reading. And thou my true word, I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, I thy true Son, thou in me dwelling, and I with thee one. Be thou my battle shield, sword.
The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 15th chapter. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the gospel of our Lord. Grace and peace to you, sisters and brothers in Christ. It's been three years since we've met our familiar friend, the prodigal son, on a Sunday morning, though it may feel like it was just yesterday, because it's pretty famous. It probably feels familiar and gives us this sense of false familiarity. You think you know this story, but there's almost always something you've got mixed up or some detail you missed. And that's often the hook in sermons about this parable. Maybe it's how throughout the Bible, the younger brother almost always wins out over the older brother, which turns the cultural expectation on its head. Maybe it's how the son, upon his return, doesn't actually ask to be reconciled. He merely confesses his sin. And maybe it's how the father, in turn, doesn't even engage on that confession. He interrupts. He skips right to the reconciliation. Maybe it's how the older son is indignant and we never hear his concerns resolved. Well, maybe, because they're kind of resolved, kind of not. See, when the father assures him, all that I have is yours, that's pretty close to literal. The younger brother's inheritance is now squandered and gone, so all that is the father's is now the older son's inheritance. Yet that's only half satisfactory because here is the father using up some of that inheritance to celebrate the younger brother. How will the brothers get along after the father is gone? And then it's time for the older brother to make the call as to whether or not to support his younger brother, the one who squandered half their resources months, years, maybe decades ago. Well, not really half, about a third would have gone to the younger brother. Should the brothers be reconciled to one another just by virtue of the father's love for each of them? Or in the father's absence, can and will they resort to their petty instincts? 
The younger, though contrite, will work as a servant. The older, indignant, jealous, and concerned for himself. Those are curious questions because for such a long parable told in several parts, it doesn't seem right for Jesus to leave such an important loose end. Normally, when we benefit from exploring a missing detail in a parable, it's because those missing details force a certain level of ambiguity. Too many details make the lesson too specific, and it's less likely to apply to you personally given your particular experiences and circumstances. But in this parable, the unspoken details are of an unknown future. What comes next? Well, for all those maybe you missed it details, let's go ahead and pile one more on. Maybe you missed that we skipped a whole bunch of verses this morning. They're missing here in Lent, but when we revisit this section of Luke in the summer, we'll get two more parables. Also unique to Luke, those two are the missing coin and the lost sheep. To oversimplify those also familiar parables, it doesn't matter how many coins you have or how many sheep you shepherd, the loss of one prompts an irrational response. We tear the house apart looking for one lost thing. We risk 99 other sheep to bring the hundredth back to safety. As much as we like to think of ourselves as rational, as though humans do things with some economic scales in mind. The reality is the mathematics of love and loss are completely irrational. We can say in earnest, in the same breath, that we love one person more than anything else in the whole world and then turn and say the exact same thing to another. So put this sequence in Luke back together. Sinners and tax collectors, people with some power and wealth but low social standing, come to hear Jesus. Then the Pharisees and scribes, who have some power but also have some social clout, some prestige, they scoff about it. If Jesus really was so great, he wouldn't be associating with such low people. And they began to grumble. It's grumbling that is also familiar. We've heard it. We've been the grumblers. That grumbling prompts Jesus' response. That response should assure the sinners, but more to the point, correct our grumbling. So Jesus illustrates the irrationality of love in humans. We are finite beings with finite time, energy, and everything else, and yet love motivates us to behave as though we have an infinite amount of each to give. How do you suppose God who does in fact have infinite time, resources, and all the rest, who is love itself, the source of love as we understand it. How will God behave in those situations? Exactly the same, and then some. God is overwhelmed with joy to see these sinners and tax collectors engaging with the word of God, seeking some repentance, some reconciliation. Despite the religious elite's claim on God, God does not join them in their resentfulness. God does not join in the grumbling. And then comes this parable of the prodigal son. Instead of hyperbolic situation for us to imagine, Jesus grounds the same sentiments back into something human and relatable. Parents can, and often do, pour out love for their children just because they are the children. And they behave irrationally as though there were a thousand inheritance to be spent or given away. Siblings often fail to see each other the same way their parents see them. God, whose stand-in, therefore, is the Father, can love both sons, despite the one's prodigalness, <laughs> running off, being reckless, lavish, etc., despite the other's resentfulness, selfishness, etc. They both missed the point. They both don't quite get it, and maybe they never will. Perhaps when the older one has his own screw-ups, perhaps when the younger one is given the chance to forgive someone else. For both, perhaps when they have their own sons who miss the point, they'll finally get it. So, we've grounded it in something human and real and familiar. So who are we in this text? Who do we relate to? Well, the truth is the acts of wandering off, coming home, reconciling, of being reckless and being self-absorbed. These are all experiences we will all have in some form or fashion to some degree during our lifetime. There's some moral lessons we can draw from each of them, lessons in how to do better. But let's keep grounded in Luke and Lent. 
Reconciliation was the end goal here, and an underlying message was how overjoyed God is to have these prodigal sinners come home. Another concern for Luke, which we've looked at a bit this season and should always bear in mind when exploring Luke, is the creation of the church. One major fruit of the gospel for Luke is the church itself. Hence, Luke includes the second volume, Acts, as to talk about the church's ministry after Jesus' ascension. Those curious questions, the unknown loose ends that might reveal ambiguity in another parable, reveal an allegory in this one. The sinners, tax collectors, scribes, and Pharisees are all there at the table listening in. Out of God's love for humanity, Jesus accepts the sinners, accepts their repentance, and facilitates reconciliation between them and God. The Pharisees are resentful, believing themselves more worthy of love, and they don't want to even associate with someone who would give those sinners a chance. The sinners and the religious elite were left behind at Jesus' ascension. Like two sons who couldn't see eye to eye, when the time comes and the Father's love was not there, compelling them to at least get along to get along, what comes next? What's after those loose ends? What will come for the sinful and the self-righteous? What do they do in Jesus' absence? That's the question in Luke and why this parable is recorded only here. How are we who are siblings in Christ going to get along when God is not here in the flesh, obviously overtly watching us, keeping us accountable? Well, it turns out we haven't always done so well. This parable is a corrective for each of us any time we've thought that another person, because of their background, identity, politics, age, wealth, history, somehow didn't belong in God's church. There is room for all, sinners and snooty alike. One last thing then, because we've had this ongoing theme to at least touch on every Sunday morning, we have to ask and answer, why do we do what we do? Well, it's a big deal here at Emmanuel, and the thing most affected, therefore changed, therefore suspended for the time being, the passing of the peace. We do this because in another place, Jesus tells us before we bring an offering before God, as to repent and seek reconciliation with God, first go be reconciled to your brother or sister. In the confines of this parable, neither brother could be reconciled completely to their father unless they were also reconciled to one another, for the father loves both sons. These things intertwine and intermingle. They come all together or they come not at all. In our seeking to be reconciled with God, we also seek to be reconciled to one another. The passing of the peace got instituted in worship as a way, one more chance, to say to each and and every one of your siblings in Christ, whatever disagreements we have, whatever our history, I wish God would grant you peace, and I'm ready to hear the same from you. God is bigger than our disagreements. God's peace is bigger than the angst, the prodigalness, the self-righteousness. We have all wandered off and we've all been the snooty sibling. God reveals that to us, then calls us, empowers us, and commands us to find peace despite those differences, to find peace together in Christ. For we who were once dead and lost in our sins have been found alive together in Christ. Amen. and tenderly Jesus is calling calling for you and for me see on the portals he's waiting 
and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, you who are weary, come home, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh, sinner, come home. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not His mercies, mercies for you and for me? Come home, come home, you who are weary, come home, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. Time is now fleeting, the moments are passing, passing from you and from me. Shadows are gathering, deathbeds are coming, coming for you and for me. Come home, come home, you who are weary, come home. Honestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh, sinner, come home. Oh, for the wonderful love He has promised, promised for you and for me. sin, He has mercy and pardon, pardon for you and for me. Come home, come home, you who are weary, come home, earnestly With that, I invite you to confess the faith of the Church using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Jesus formed the disciples in the ways of extravagant mercy and profound welcome. Lead your church to be a community marked by forgiveness, hospitality, and celebration. 
Send us to transform a world plagued by fear and condemnation. Lord, in your mercy. You make the land to produce a harvest that sustains your entire creation. Equip farmers and farm workers who till the soil. Nourish the earth with ample rainfall and abundant sunshine. Heal grounds tainted by pollution or misuse. Lord, in your mercy. Countries are divided and leaders often harbor grudges. Reconcile nations that experience conflict, especially Ukraine and Russia. Act quickly to bring an end to war, particularly that war. Anoint peacemakers trained in the art of diplomacy and foster a spirit of collaboration among political rivals. We pray especially for those who may be in harm's way due to those rivalries. We pray for John, Josh, Tyler, Jack, Matt, Nick, and Dane. Lord, in your mercy. Your people cry out for help in times of distress, resolve disagreements among family members, save those experiencing financial hardship, Hear our prayers for those who are sick or grieving. We pray especially for Jerry, Jim, Charlene, Gail, Lisa, Chloe, Connie, Larry, John, and Melody, Grace, Danny, Connie, Kendall, Jean, Horst, Barbara, Serenata, Carol, Leona, Andrea, Mabel, Crystal, Bob, Ivan, Aaron, Brian, Kevin, and Udell. Console us with the promise that everything can become new. Lord, in your mercy. Your love comes to us when a table is set and a feast is prepared. Bless the feeding ministries of your greater church. Bring an end to hunger in our community and around the world. Lord, in your mercy. The one who was dead is alive again. We give thanks for those who have died, confident that steadfast love surrounds them. Shelter them in your love until we are gathered at your heavenly banquet. Lord, in your mercy. Accept the prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of a world in need. For the sake of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And as you take a moment to share a greeting of peace, we will pray together over gifts given and received this past week. With that, let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us in what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You are children of God, anointed with the oil of gladness and strengthened for the journey. Almighty God, motherly, majestic, and mighty, be with you this day and always. Amen. Go in peace. Jesus meets you on the way. Thanks be to God.